Welcome everybody to another BDA Midnight Podcast, broadcasting to you from the witching hour, to all you late night freaks out there, all you insomniacs, all you drunks, all you late night partiers, this one is for you, and uh, May the 6th, we just had Canelo beating Julio Cesar Chavez by a wide, unanimous decision, <sighs> I mean, what can I say, what can I say? Seldom do you see a fight going exactly like the majority of boxing fans predicted it. And this is what's going to happen all along. I remember the day of the fight, I saw a precise presenter's video that he dropped. And he was talking about how the Chavez Canelo fight was a circus. It was a money grab. And I agreed with everything he said and with everything the commenters said in the comment section. And guess what? I still went to see the fight. Want to know why? Because I'm a degenerate boxing fan. I'm a junkie. Even if I know the outcome is going to be boring, bad, a waste of money and a waste of time, I still, I'm still still going to go see it. Because that's just what I am. I've, I've made my peace with that. You know, I could have been in a five-star restaurant with a beautiful girl at 10. And if I would have walked into the bathroom and seen Chavez and, and Canelo sparring in the bathroom, I would have stayed there and watched it. Because I'm sick. I'm a sick bastard. Well, let's get this out of the way first. All right, guys? Let's get Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. out of the way both in terms of in the podcast and in the boxing world in general. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. came in in shape. Wow, everybody started clapping and, and, and clamoring and, you know, giving him props. Oh, he came in weight. He didn't look drained. Wow. And then he showed up and he did exactly what he'd been doing in his career. He doesn't give it his all. Now, look, I always try to give boxers the benefit of the doubt. They're hard men. It takes balls to step into the ring. And, and it's not easy putting pressure on a guy like Canelo, who's so precise, and yes, he does hit hard. I know people out there are saying that Canelo doesn't hit hard. We'll get to that later. On the other hand, from what I read, Chavez is getting paid, or he got paid about $3 million. I have to assume that he's also getting money from the Mexican TV stations, a cut of it too. So he's getting paid handsomely for his service, or should I say this service, and he didn't even try. Don't tell me, oh, but in the sixth round or eighth round, he, re he tried to throw a combination. He didn't try. He went into survival mode from the fifth round on and he was lucky that Canelo is not a pressure fighter and that he couldn't take him out. Actually, it should have been better if, if Canelo would have taken him out. Would have been a service to all, all of us here. Because this fight, let me tell you something. I mean, ugh. So Chavez Jr., I know it's hard getting in the ring, guys. I know, I mean, we got to give these guys their props. But when you're getting paid this type of money, and you know, we're not millionaires. Boxing fans, we're not millionaires. We're dropping $50 on a pay-per-view or 100 and more on a ticket, you expect to get some kind of show. And Chavez showed us that, nah. This was his chance, by the way. This was Chavez's chance to, hey, first of all, his last chance at gaining some respect. He shouldn't even have gotten this chance. If you think about it, who did he beat since from far? He beat Marco Reyes, who's a tough guy, but a punching bag. He's like a, he's like a Chavez light. He's got big balls, I respect that. But in terms, if you want really want to talk objectively about levels, he didn't deserve to be in there. And Chavez couldn't take him out either. Okay, he's a tough guy. He beat that, right? right? And then he beat uh, uh, the German guy, Screech. I don't even know how to say his name. I'm not even going to bother to look it up. Because that's how angry I am about this. About what I just saw, what I just witnessed, what just transpired, this abomination, this abortion. And uh, so, yeah. So why did Chavez, how did he earn this chance? And we all fell for it. I fell for it. Despite knowing every, that this fight was not going to be. It was like, a, it was like made with a pack all over again. You know what's going to happen, but part of inside says, ah, maybe if he does this, maybe he does that. Nah, not going to happen. And it didn't happen this time either. And uh, you know what? I got no, nobody to blame but myself. Free will and all that shit. Um, so Chavez Jr., I don't know how he earned this chance. I don't know why people were expecting a war. Actually, yes, I was expecting a war myself. I thought he was going to put pressure on. And then after getting countered for a couple of rounds, I expected him to go into survival mode, just like he did with Martinez before Chavez was able to rally down the stretch in the last round. But in this fight, there was no pressure at all. From the get-go, he tasted Canelo's best shots and he said, whoops, time to go, time to earn my paycheck by just trying to survive. So Chavez Jr., you know, good for you. You got your money. Goodbye. We don't want to see you again. I have a feeling, however, that if he gets three more performances in Mexico, he might be in line to face another guy. 
Because you know that's how boxing works. Zab Judah, seven lives, right? How many guys did he lose against? And he's still, you still see his name being propped up. He, he might even take on Keith Thurman one of these days. You never know. That's how boxing works, man. You got a name, you're marketable, you win a couple of fights, and people forget what happened. So let's get that. Well, now we got, that, we got that out of the way. It just goes to show you how bad a fight it was that people are talking about Golovkin, Chav, uh, Golovkin Canelo, the announcement more than the fight that we just saw yesterday. Am I excited about Canelo Golovkin? Of course I am. Even though the, the, the bad taste that's left in my mouth from yesterday is sort of clouding my judgment a little bit here, my outlook. I got a little bit of a negative outlook right now. I'm thinking, what if the fight doesn't happen? What if it's a, like, like a stupid catch? What if this? What if that? What if the ring is a huge ring? I mean, I don't know. But let's look at it from the positive side, right? If the fight does happen on September 16, right on the money, if it does happen, I expect a good fight. I want to talk about Canelo's power. I've been scouring the internet, reading all sorts of messages and message boards and, 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 and comment sections from all types of boxing sites because I want to get my finger on the pulse of the boxing world. And what people are saying constantly is that Canelo doesn't punch hard. And they say, well, he couldn't get Chavez out of there. That means he doesn't punch hard. First of all, the fact that Chavez went into survival mode from around the fourth, fifth round on should tell you how hard Canelo hits. Yeah, he doesn't hit as hard as Golovkin. I don't know if anybody does, even even Kovalev. But Canelo, trust me, he's got booming shots. And uh, if Golovkin goes in there thinking he can just walk through Chavez, uh, to Canelo, which I don't think he does, he has sparred Canelo. Golovkin's a very smart fighter. He's not just a power puncher. He knows how hard Canelo can hit. He knows that it's going to be a waiting game as well. It's going to have to be an intelligent boxing match. He's not just going to go in there and try to slug it out. He's not. But to say that Canelo can't hurt him, yeah, you might be surprised once you see the fight happen. Because Canelo hits not as hard, like I said, but pretty fucking hard. And I had to add the F word in there just to add a little emphasis, you know? That's how I do it here. But he does hit pretty hard. One thing that does worries me, worry me as a, as a Golovkin fan if I were a huge Golovkin fan, and if I were betting money on him, because I'm thinking, I never bet guys, but I'm thinking maybe I should bet on Golovkin here if, if, if his, bat, his, his uh, human performance against Jacobs sort of lowers the odds a little bit. The thing that worries me for Golovkin is the body shots. I wasn't 100% sure about it. If you, if you watch the film analysis that we did for the Golovkin-Jacobs fight, I said that Golovkin doesn't like the body shots. I know nobody does. And nobody likes body shots, but he has a peculiar way of reacting to it. Like a very visible, it's quite visible that he doesn't enjoy them. And against Jacobs, it was pretty apparent he was very worried about his body shots. And I got to tell you, as hard a puncher as Jacobs is, and as big a guy as he is, or was when he went into the ring against Golovkin, Canelo hits much better to the body. He's got better technique. And those type of shots could deplete Golovkin. On the other hand, Flip side to that coin is that Golovkin hits harder than Canelo, both to the head and I would argue maybe to the body as well. Golovkin puts incredible pressure. He's not as active as he could have been back in the day, three years ago maybe, four years ago. He slowed down a tad, but he still got that power, he still has that technique, he still has that positioning. He's able to position himself in a way that where he can launch his offense to the maximum of its efficiency, to maximum effect. And I gotta tell you something else too. If Golovkin would have been in there against, against Chavez last night, he would have stopped Chavez. Not because necessarily just because of the power, that the fact that he hits hard than Canelo, but also the way he positions his shots. He would have gotten inside much more than Canelo. He would have cut off the ring much better and he would have landed murderous uppercuts. I have a feeling he would have stopped Chavez last night. Also, the other thing that should play a factor in a Canelo-Golovkin fight, and we'll talk more about that once the fight nears. It's still a long way to go from, from now. But one thing that you're going to have to watch out for is that Golovkin jab. Whew, that's a strong jab. That won him the fight against Jacobs. It's a nice, crisp jab. It's almost like a power punch. It's, it's, it's effective. It's, it's precise. It comes out of nowhere. It's going to bust up Canelo's face some, let me tell you. And if I'm a Canelo fan, and I am, I'm worried about whether he can actually handle Golovkin's power. Because if he just stays with the earmuffs, it's going to be effective for a while. But the more you stand in front of a guy with those earmuffs on, the more those some shots are going to get through. 
And uh, if the fight's at 160, actually, that's the other thing. I'd rather have the fight at a higher weight. Make it like a, you know, 165 or something. Don't dehydrate these guys. I know we want to see it for the fucking, for the middleweight title of the world, the linear uh, middleweight title of the world, right? We want to see it for the middleweight championship. There's a rich history behind the middleweight division, perhaps the most accomplished or prestigious division in boxing. I know some people would say it's the heavyweights, but is it really in terms of exciting matchups? The middleweights have produced more exciting, interesting matchups between elite fighters since boxing uh, adopted its modern form. So that is then. A big fight was announced in September. Let's not talk too much about it, though, because we might jinx it. I hope not. Knock on wood. That's me knocking on wood. And now my neighbors are going to think I'm crazy for doing so much, making so much noise at midnight, but hey, fuck them. What do they know, right? Now, what else happened? On the other card, we had David Lemieux taking on Marcos Reyes. Lemieux, wow, power puncher, man. Might just be the most dangerous guy in the middleweight division, punching-wise. Just for pure punching power. And he's going to beat a lot of guys. If you can't avoid his power punches and you can't handle his intensity, he's just going to run through you or outwork you. And a lot of guys are going to be able to survive the way Reyes did. On the other hand, what I don't like about Lemieux is that those baby deer legs, as I call them, his footwork... He's always on the toe, on his toes. Both feet are on, he's on his toes. He's always on the tip of his feet and he's off balance after he, if he misses his off balance. It's amazing to see a guy who, with such awkward footwork, be able to generate so much power. He's a, he's a, he's a strange dude, Lemieux. And I like Lemieux because he's always coming to fight. Anytime Lemieux fights, I'm going to watch him. That's just the type of guy he is, man. Action all the way through. But if there was a winner yesterday, other than Canelo, Engel Lovkin, because now that, that their fight is made, the other winner is Lemieux. Because he's not going to be fighting any of those guys anytime soon. And that's good because Golovkin, you know, Lemieux has been in the press saying that he, he's, he found the right way now. He knows how to beat Golovkin. No, you don't. Sorry, you don't. He, he, he showed against Reyes. He couldn't take him out. He took some shots. He was still vulnerable to the jab. And like I said before, Golovkin's got a hell of a jab. It would be a repeat of, of the first fight. Canelo, on the other hand, would be more hittable. He, I've never seen him actually win a fight just on his jab alone, but uh, he would pick Lemieux apart. And it would be an exciting fight, don't get me wrong, but I don't, I don't see Lemieux uh, beating him. Now, of course, it's up to Lemieux to prove us wrong. This is boxing, after all. Nobody's get every, always right with the predictions, but that fight's not going to happen anytime soon. So where does Lemieux go from here? I don't know. You know, he's got Danny Jacobs in there. That could be a good fight. Maybe Kurtzide, who just uh, beat Tommy Langford in England. That would be a good fight, too. Two blocks of stone power punches up the wazoo. That would be a great fight. But Lemieux, always entertaining. Props to him. Good fight against a tough, tough, tough opponent last night. I don't know if the guy was on drugs or something. I've never seen somebody. I remember I heard a story once about a guy who was on PCP. And no matter what you hit him with, kick him in the balls, in the fucking orbital bone, the guy would not go down. And that's how it reminded me. Marcos Reyes reminded me a little bit of that, of that story. Also, on the undercard, we had the return of the machine, Lucas Matisse. And man, he beat up Manuel Taylor something awful taylor is a tough guy he's gone he's proven that he can hang in there with good guys like algeri broner or roscoe but this fight oh matisse proved that the power is the last thing to go and maybe that that one year rest did him some good a little chance to recoup both mentally and physically and now he's back a 147 though i don't i don't know guys what do you think do you think he can be competitive in that division i i don't see him first of all he's with golden boy so i don't know how many fights could be made with the PBC, although there are rumors that I think I heard, I read an article that Steve Kim tweeted. He linked it to his, his, his Twitter about some uh, journalist saying that rumors that Heyman and De La Hoya, I don't know if he was kidding or not, though. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this at all. But anyway, let's say that the, 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 the fights can be made. Let's go, let's go all out boxing utopia where every fight can be made and there are no political borders to cross. Matisse, I don't, he doesn't beat Thurman. Might be competitive because he's a good fighter and he does hit hard and he, he, he does have some technique. But but Thurman, just too mobile and too fast for him. 
I think he beats him. Danny Garcia, now this fight, Danny Garcia looked, he looked sharp against Thurman. It was a high level fight, very fast paced. I don't know if, if, if Matisse can, can keep up with that type of pace. Sean Porter though, now that would be an interesting fight because Sean Porter comes forward. He's not gonna hide, I don't think, from Matisse, although uh, Porter has good footwork, so he might pull, turn the tables on us and try to show us that he could box uh, Matisse. Timothy Bradley would be a good fight also, easier to make if, if we do include the political borders in this fight or in this boxing world. He's with top rank, top rank has shown that they are willing to work with Golden Boy recently, so maybe that's an easier fight to make. Of course, Matisse against maybe Robert Guerrero, right? Just uh, as, a, as a key BC fight, I don't know, that would be an interesting fight. But Porter, Matisse is one that I would want to see. But again, I don't know how, how, how Matisse is going to be able to perform at 147, especially now at 34 years old. Time is not on his side, he's going to move, he's going to make his move now. He's going to make his mark and enforce it, like Tony Montana said. And uh, but good from it's good to see it was good to see the machine back. He's an entertaining fighter to watch. He throws combinations. He's willing to go in for the kill, just like Lemieux, and so good for him. Also on the undercard, we had Joseph Jojo Diaz taking a unanimous decision. And I'm just gonna forgot the his opponent's name. I'm gonna sh uh, look it up to uh, show him some respect. Because let me tell you something about Jojo Diaz while I'm looking the name up. Let's talk about Jojo Diaz. He is a very, very, very talented fighter, man. He's got an amateur pedigree, he's got technique, and he just beat last night Manuel Avila, that's his name, he'll be support Manuel Avila, 22-0. Avila, apparently from what I heard from the commenters, he'd been looking for big fights, he wasn't getting any respect, or as much uh, uh, respect, I should say, as jo jo uh, Joseph Diaz. And he tried, man. He came in, you could see he was well schooled, he had a plan, he had hand speed, good power, sitting on his shots, and he caught Diaz a couple of times, but Diaz just, once he went, he turned it, turned it up a notch, he, he was on another gear, on another level, and Avila just couldn't keep up with him. That's what happens sometimes when you get like, a guy like Diaz, who not only is he technically sound, but he's also athletically gifted. The way he can get in and out, his reflexes, his speed, I mean, Gonna be a very hard guy to fight. I would love to see Joseph Diaz now up against Miguel Mariaga. Because that would be a good test, man. Mariaga gave a good f uh, showing in his last fight against a tough prospect, a hard hitting prospect. Diaz doesn't quite hit as hard. But uh, it's, 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 it would be a good test to see if he can outbox somebody. Now the thing about that worries me about uh, about Diaz is he's five foot five. He's listed at five foot five, which means he's actually five foot four. Because usually what people in TV, in the TV business, do is they like to prop up or, or exaggerate somebody's measurements. I remember in the UFC they listed uh, Shane Carwin, who was a big power puncher, at six foot five. The guy was actually six foot three. Or in, or in WWF E, whatever you want to call it. I remember they used to say the Undertaker was six foot nine or seven feet tall or something. He's actually more like what six foot five, six foot six, maybe. So they exaggerate. So Joseph Diaz, right now at featherweight, he's five foot four, five foot five. I don't know how good he would be able to, to do to compete at uh, higher weights. And when you're a guy like him, who's as fast and as technically sound, you don't have to be smaller. I mean, high, uh, the same height as other guys to outbox him. We have. We've had plenty of examples before of, of, of smaller guys outboxing taller guys. Terence Crawford, Postol, for example. Postol was taller, that doesn't mean, but if you know what to do, and if you got hand speed, you can outbox taller guys. But um, the fight that everybody wants to see maybe would be Oscar Valdez against Joseph Diaz. I don't think that fight's gonna happen, not anytime soon anyway. Both guys have too much to lose. And with, with big things in the horizon, so that fight's not gonna happen. You got Carl Frampton in there, you got Scott Quigg, who is the dark horse of the division, people have forgotten about him, but he's a good guy, good solid power puncher, and a body puncher to boot, which I love, you guys know that I love body punchers. But yeah, man, that's about it for this BDA Midnight Podcast. Uh, fuck, man, that Chavez fight, though. I still feel like I wanna say something about it just to get it off my shoulders, man. I feel like I got a ghost on my shoulders, like that movie, Japanese movie, I forget the name, where a guy's got a ghost on his back because he cheated the ghost back when the ghost was alive or something, I don't know. I'm not Roger Ebert, as you can see, but 
I mean, this is Chavez Jr., man. Ugh, Canelo. But hey, Canelo Golovkin, right? Now, as I prepare to log off and go to sleep, I want I want you guys to tell me what you would want to see. What videos would you want me to do? I'm the guy, like like I told you, King Bucho, he, he, he likes to do more of a commentary. He takes the Twitter page. He makes uh, commentary videos on, on the YouTube page. I focus, try to focus more on the BDA Midnight Podcast and on the film analysis. So... Right now, we don't have, other than Kovalev, uh, Kovalev Ward, the rematch, which we, if, if there's enough demand, we will do a, f- a film analysis on that. But other than that, there's not a lot of big, 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 huge mega fights in the summer left. So I don't know if we're still going to be making any film analysis. But I do enjoy making the BDA Vault film analysis. So that's when we dip into the BDA Vault into the archives of classic fights or just interesting fights, fights that we find interesting. We like to dissect them and, and, and or just show you certain aspects of that fight or of a certain fighter, for example, footwork, hand speed, power. So if you guys want to see something in particular, just let us know and we'll, and we'll do our best to provide a video like that. I was thinking of doing a video on the Charlo brothers because I think these guys, they're starting to convince me that they are the real deal. And I want to make a video on the Charlo brothers about how good they are of how good they really are and how far they might go. So, guys, keep us informed, man. We listen here at the BDA. We want to see what you guys have to say. I'm enjoying the comments. Shout out to Nicola Ferrari and True Boxing, who have been going back and forth in the Errol Spence, Kell Brook film analysis video in the comment section. They're going back and forth with arguments. Good arguments from both sides. This is what I want. This is the boxing debate arena. It should look like way that way, guys. Blood on the ground. Right? We're here to entertain, we're here to discuss, we're here to create controversy. We want to say things that are controversial. And why are they controversial? Because they might just be true and people don't want to hear those type of things. Sometimes the truth stinks and people don't want to hear it. The medicine tastes bad, but guess what? Once you take that medicine, once you take that pill, you feel much better afterwards. So guys, there was a BDA film, I mean film analysis, Jesus Christ, I'm so used to saying that. It was a BDA Midnight Podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and we will see you on the next one.